been doing different sections. Some of you with me from last month, we said people were talking to college, but I really realize a lot of people are struggling, and um, I just really feel a passion about just trying to help people out. Um, some people are going to hear, some people are not. And if you remember uh, when I first got here at WU some 14 years ago, in those first few years, I was, I was really harping on being debt free by saying, you know, Lord, just put some things on my heart and um, still strong. And I'm realizing as time goes on of what's occurring, a lot of your take home pay uh, is getting smaller. But the problem is your bills are doing what? They're getting bigger. And, and, and some of my colleagues, churches, they're struggling. They're literally struggling. Uh, because they, they've got these big edifices and uh, all these building projects, but now their positions aren't able to give as much as they used to. So what are they doing? They're squeezing them more, they're begging, um, they're selling prayer cloths, um, prayer handkerchiefs and napkins, and uh, sweet water, um, all kinds of stuff just to pay the bill. I don't want Ebenezer to ever be like that, and I don't want to personalize you like that. It took me a long time to realize that everybody who looks good may not be financially sound. I, I used to think, you know, people, people drive a nice car, live in a nice house, you know, they got to have it together. But that's not necessarily true. Some do, but some are really struggling, and they're able to keep it up from uh, month to month, but there's got to be something better. So today we're going to challenge you uh, with scriptures. Um, hopefully I'll get on some of these nerves and you'll really start digging in it for yourself, and you'll want to change. One thing I found out about this, um, you cannot uh, change until you get God's word in your heart. you got to see that it's significant. If you think, uh, is, God just wants me to keep on about him, you're not going to change. But when you're challenged and you see God's word, then perfectly, well, I know, you accept that change will take place. Um, let me see what I have in my pocket today. What does that do for you? Anybody? I'll pull this out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One at a time, because I want to hear all of you. I really want to hear all of you. Just raise your hand. See how many raise your hand? Yeah. Gas money. It's many. Just, just get rid of it. Okay. Cell phone bill. Cell phone bill? Part of it. Part of it, okay. Part of it. Lunch. Lunch. Yeah, that's a nice lunch. Somebody, somebody going to ask for one? Somebody going to ask for one? Huh? Okay, put it in your pocket. What do you need to do to save it? All right, Andrew. Your water would be. That's the answer I need. Money. It's just really, this is just paper. Actually, it's fire, fabric. Um, we went to the, um, they call it, the place where they make money. What did you say, Dean? Department of Treasury. When it came, we found out this is really not paper. It's fabric. That's what makes it last longer. What makes this a $20 bill? No, the picture. Okay, and the number. What's so significant about the number? It says 20. What else? What, what makes this, though? A twenty dollar bill. We said it was. All right, G. What did you say? I said because we said it is. Because we said it is. Um, Phil, you had your hand up. He said it. We said this is a twenty dollar bill. And what I'm trying to get you, and when we get these scriptures, you got to understand. Right now, especially at this time in our history, it hasn't been like this any other time. This really doesn't stand for anything but what we believe. It's not that totally by gold. It used to be twenty dollars would actually equate to uh, a gold piece that was had some kind of piece to it. But we've got to a point in the United States that really a twenty is not a twenty. And we're going to talk about some other things in there. And, and we're struggling with that because we're expecting the twenty to stay a twenty, but it's not. This twenty is about what now? <laughs> it depends on where you're at. A, you said about a one dollar bill. We all can see it's going up. Uh, what's helped me to see really uh, in my mind is that when I went to Jamaica, a 20, this 20 is like a 10 cent bill. 
because inflation is going up so much. So you can go to $100, you go to McDonald's, you get a burger, a fry, a Coke, it's $100 over there, right, when you equate it doing the conversions. So please understand, and that's what we're going to talk about. Hopefully, the scriptures today are going to set you free from this. We've all got to use it, but I want you to be set free from this. I want you to control this, and this not to control you. Okay, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Well, let me hook this thing up. So I'm going to go ahead and Ecclesiastes chapter 6. I'll right, get this hooked up. And we're going to look at 1 through 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, 1 through 5. Small to large. That is a dinner of where love is 
than a fed calf with hatred. We were honest with ourselves. Some of you had the most controversy in your home over what? Money. 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 It's true. You, you're sitting there trying to eat with somebody, and you can't have a quiet meal because you think about dollars and cents. Don't you want to get past that? Don't you want to get to the point of not having to worry about that and put it all in perspective? And that's what we're going to deal with. So I want to read that. The Beatles thing. That's what the Beatles said. Money can't buy you love, but don't we chase it so hard? We want it, and we see things, and our commercialism really just uh, kicks us in our minds and our heads, because they tell us, if you get this, you're going to feel love, you're going to feel better about yourself. If you drive this car, everybody's going to think you're great. All of these things, they tell us that, and even Christians, we buy into it. We buy into that, that mindset. Some of you, I thank God for wonderful clothes, but some people feel like a designer clothes or a designer pattern, that's going to make you a better person. It really doesn't. The world speaks this into our thing, into our mindset, so we've got to make sure we get to the point of knowing, hey, it's not about having a whole bunch of money. Money can't buy me love. I've got to put Christ first, and then I have to decide, Lord, what are you speaking to me? And, and I've been challenging you to examine the scriptures. I've examined the scriptures over and over because I want to know what's right when it comes to money because it affects so many people. Look at this next one, Proverbs 10, 22. This is the blessing of the Lord makes what? One rich. One rich and what? Yes, All right, I want to slow down. Anybody want to be blessed? Yes. The blessings of the Lord makes what? Makes us rich. But God says that he adds no what? Sorrow. sorrow with it. How many of you thought you had a blessing, but sorrow was with you? Mm. I, I, want you to, I want you to really be able to discern with this, because I've been there so often. You know, you, you get something, and you're like, ha. You're like, woo. But then it wears off so quick. And then the bill comes every month and interest comes every month and you're like this is not feeling so good the devil can give us stuff to you he wants us to make a deal with him and get in our mindsets so that we can follow him and then blame it on God he wants us to say you know what God you got me in this spot when it was all about us making decisions and choices and I don't know the pressures I've been there but look at this, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich. You want to be rich? I don't want to raise your hand if you think that's a, a trick question. Yeah, I think we do want to be rich. We want to be financially well off, everything in place. So we want the blessings of the Lord, but this is the issue. We don't want the sorrow. We don't want the sorrow. You ever cried over money? You know, hurt, it, it, it can hurt so many times. How do we know our riches are from the Lord? Again, we know it if we have no sorrow with those riches. And this, this follows clear. If you can look at your life and you're not struggling from that which you think is a blessing from the Lord, then most likely it's not it's from the Lord. If you're not struggling with that or you're not fighting over your life, man, how am I going to pay this? How am I going to pay this? You always have to go back. How did I get in this in the first place? Isn't it easy to get in debt? Yeah. Yeah. Easy to get you back up against the wall. Everybody, you don't have to be a, a rocket scientist to figure out that it is. And you're not, actually, church should be full today because there's so many people that are going through and struggling. Look at Ecclesiastes 10 19. And we're just going to go through scripture today, and I'm just going to challenge you over and over again. Someone read that, that first part, Ecclesiastes 10 19. A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry, but money answers everything. All right. That's in Ecclesiastes 10.19. What do you think? What, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Gina? You got your hand halfway up. So go ahead. <laughs> uh, feast is made for laughter. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to mean a meal. It could mean uh, the blessings that you get. Uh, it makes you happy. Okay. Um, uh, a wine makes merry. Uh, you can turn that a couple of ways. I mean, if you drink, uh, if you drink wine, uh, it can relax you and make you happy and make you forget about your woes or what have you. Uh, 
um, or make you be able to deal with them more. Uh, money answers everything. Uh, I kind of disagree with that, but I mean, <laughs> um, money, money. You have to, you have to have money in this world to survive. Okay. So it, um, it's good if you have it because you will have the things that you desire or want or need. But if you don't have it, uh, then you have woes. Okay. All right. Eventually, the things that you're spending are going to go up. 
but what you have is right here, or it's going to shrink. And this is what's happening with our with our society. We can feel it. We can sense that there's a change. We can sense, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you know, the price goes up. We can sense when we see our electric bill. Anybody look at your electric bill? It's kind of creeping up. You're like, I didn't change that much. Or, or your water bill. You, you can sense it, but the problem is, it's not like your managers are just giving you more raises or just money is flowing in. So if we've got to get it in our mind, just like Yogi Bear said, a nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. So that means I can't spend all of my dime. Right? I, I can't. Because it's not what it used to be. I've got to have a mentality here. Okay, God, you blessed me with $20,000. I don't want to have a mindset I'm going to spend all that $20,000. Because, Lord, you blessed me with this so that I can have peace in my heart and I can still bless others and I can still give. The problem with our mindset, a lot of times we get a raise and we go, Woo! What do, we, what do we say then when I get a rate? When you get a rate? That's great. What am I going to buy next? Oh, what am I going to buy next? I can get what I want. You know, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And what we do is we raise our spending. And now that raise, it doesn't matter. You know what? You can be, you can make $100,000, $150,000. It doesn't matter if you're spending $150,000. Or you're spending $180,000 and you make $150,000. Or you're spending two hundred thousand dollars and you're making one hundred fifty thousand dollars. You're just as broke, busting, and disgusted as anybody who just doesn't have anything. So a lot of times we want to make more, but the issue is not making more; is being able to use what you have, and in that sense, bring your spending down, which we're going to talk about some more later. Proverbs eleven, uh, thirteen, eleven says, "Someone read that, please." Wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly disappears. Well, from hard work grows over time. All right. As you look at this, there's so much advertising out there. And you'll see it. Get rich quick. Let's put $100 in, $500 in, and we're going to double your investment. I'm telling you, that, that just really doesn't happen in the normal life. Even stocks now. Stocks are down. Your percentages are down. Some of you got excited uh, some years ago, five to seven years ago. Your stocks were just going. You were getting 10, 15%, 20%. And then what happened? What happened to you, man? <laughs> it died. It, it took a drop. It did all that. I saw your faces. You, you were coming to church. You're like, you know, my stocks are up. You know, like your time was looking good. And all of a sudden, it was amazing. I saw it. When the stock market died, some of you came in like, And some of you start thinking, I gotta get a double job, I gotta go back to work, because it died. And that's why money is fleeting. So we see this wealth from get rich quick schemes quickly disappears. Wealth from what? Hard work. Hard work. Hard work. Hard work. I, I don't suggest this, but grandma had something when she used to put her money up under the, the pillows and the batches and everything. Because she understood if I if I earn this bit by bit, it's going to grow. And a lot of times we want it quick. And it's a natural thing. I want to turn my money over really, really quick. But that doesn't. You have to have wisdom and you have to have it take it one day at a time. As we've been talking about getting out of debt, I wish I could give you a solution to make it quick. You know, I can say, you know, in 20, 20 days, the Lord said, you'll be completely out of debt. But it usually doesn't work. Think about how long it took you to get into debt where you're at. Some of you took four years, six years, ten years. And sometimes God wants you to get it to walk backward very slow to see how committed you are. But I'm a living witness. I'm telling you, if you trust the Lord, you get in his word, you seek his face and start praying and say, I'm going to change my lifestyle, you will get to a point that you won't have any debt and you can say, God did. But you're going to have to make some tough decisions. You're going to have to change some of your lifestyles. You're going to have to change your way. Uh, somebody said you got to change your stinking thing. Mm -hmm. You've got to get to the point and say, it's better. They told me um, that you always would have to have a mortgage. That's what I was told. When I say, hey, I don't want to. I was told that. Mm -hmm. you, you, would, you would always have a mortgage. Um, you may get out of it when you retire or something like that, but it's going to take you 20 years. So 30 years, actually, it was 30 years. It's going to take you 30 years. Nobody ever told me there was another option. 
Nobody ever told me that you could actually get a mortgage for 15 years. Nobody told me that. When I when I got into my house, it was 30 years. That was just that was it. And I was excited. Actually, I want to say you have a 40 year. Or, <laughs> I mean, nobody I, nobody told me that. Nobody ever told me that. Um, my my parents in debt. Um, I, I learned. I was told as long as you can pay off your credit cards, you pay your mortgage, you can pay your your thing on your car. That's the way. That's living. No you can get anything you want if you have good credit. That's what I was told. So I grew up, and, and Bianca knows I was I was broke when I when I married my wife. I'll be honest. I borrowed money from my wife to get a car. She wouldn't even my wife. What you say, mom? I was I was broke, busting, disgusting. So so my wife. Wasn't that intelligent at the time? She was just so much in love with me. <laughs> so, what she's saying, okay, I'll give you the money if you don't let any other woman ride in that car. I, 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 she said, I'll give you the money if, if, if you won't let anybody else sit in that seat. I said, I took a little bit. I said, okay, we can work this out. We can work this out. But it wasn't to pay the car off, it was to get the car. So, that was the whole process and what changed my life. He started looking at these scriptures. And when God said, Oh, no man, anything but to love. I tried to spiritualize it and everything. I started looking at more. We're going to go through some more scriptures. And I was like, Lord, is, is there a way? I don't know of a way. I didn't have anybody to go to. I didn't have anybody who was there. Maybe you were there, but you didn't come to me and tell me that. I didn't know. I didn't know. So I said, Bianca and I got together. We was like, There's got to be another way. We started listening to financial people and everything, and we made a life change. We started to say, Lord, if you give us more, we're going to take that money and we're going to start putting it towards the debt. And we were serious about it. And you know what? Over a period of time, how long did it take us, be? Eight years, everything's paid off. And you know what my biggest battle now? What do you think my biggest battle is? <laughs> My parents built a house, three-bedroom house, full basement. It was not in debt. They paid as they went. They built the house. And, and, and now I look back on my life and said, why did I think that we could have saved and got out of debt with more? You know? Because they did. That 50 years ago, yes, 50 years ago, things wasn't expensive. But it was expensive for them. They were making a whole bunch of money. They were putting their money. I remember seeing money in a big, what they call them, those jars. I remember seeing money in that because they were going to go buy the wood to go do this. And then, when, and then they'd go buy the wood, whatever else they needed. And the furnace and all that kind of stuff. The patience they had, which we don't have. We want it right now. Right now. Get rich. Get rich quick. That whole process, and I'll get you a chance. I want to change. See, a lot of times we're here. And we go, okay, well, Pastor, you know, I'm on good debt. That's because we never got to the point, we were never taught to be patient and save our money. So now we got to walk back. What's the best way of being in debt? Well, that's not what I want to present to you today, the best way to be in debt. There are a lot of better ways to be in debt. But what God is saying with the scriptures, okay, let's step back. How do I get back to that first and change my mindset? No more. It stops right here. I really want to change my life. Not so I can, you know, have a whole bunch, but I can be effective for the kingdom. And I just don't have to worry about that. Nobody ever told me that you could pay cash for a car. Mm -hmm. You know that. Did you remember? You probably knew that. Your parents probably, you know, told you that. My parents didn't tell me that. I didn't know. I didn't know you could bring in cash. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that. You know that price tag, $20,000, $30,000 on the side? I was like, I didn't look at that. I looked at what it was on one. That was I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> That's what, see how much I can make. That's what I looked at. Nobody told me that people actually came and paid the sticker price. I didn't know that. I thought you had to haggle and do all of these things. But when you got cash, it's amazing the deal that you can get. To. But again, Changing mindset, going back, this is nothing new. Our forefathers knew that, for example. 
just lost their grandpa on pass. He told them everywhere to go look at the home to get up. So wow. yeah, they did it. They finally got all the money that he was taking out of the ship. They decided to take it and put it in the work. He passed it up another half a million dollars. That was not one of the ones that he was going to do with the ship that he was tired. So I'll take my hand and take that. Bit by bit, bit by bit, you can go and do that. You gotta change your mindset. You gotta change your mindset. It's about, nobody told me about saving, really. That you were supposed to pay yourself. I know y'all do that. I'm just talking for me. This is my testimony. I'm gonna pay myself. Nobody, everybody told me, I, you know, you get it, you spend it. You know, if there's anything left over, have fun with it. But that's not what Johanna says. Wealth that stays is gained over time. Bit by bit. How does the world advertise wealth? How does the world advertise wealth? Stuff. Bling. Shiny. Yeah. It's big. Oversized. All these things. We as Christians cannot buy into that. We've got to humble ourselves. And I'm telling you, and I've told people that come to me, sometimes downsizing is the, just what you need. And you got you can't worry about what people think about you, what people are saying about you. You gotta say, you know what? What's more important is what God says and doing what God says. Because I want peace in my life. I'm tired of getting whipped by a dollar. I'm tired of getting whipped, whipped by twenty or hundred dollar bills. I want to control that. So what you said was the marketing debt out there, the enemy has deceived us of his wealth, and we're purchasing that product of debt into our homes like we're gaining something. Well, we've got to change our thinking and see that that's a product that we don't have to purchase because that's debt that they're advertising that they're showing, not wealth. Very good point, especially if you're getting in debt to get to that point of those bling bling. They're really advertising debt. Changing our, our mindset of thinking about those. Look at this. Uh, Ken Hubbard said, the safest way to double your money is to fold it over and put it in your pocket. <laughs> Amen? Here, stop thinking about, you know, how can I double my money? I want you to start thinking, God, how can I be responsible for what I have now? How can I make more money out of what I have right now? That means you're going to have to change your mindset. Uh, we, we went through another seminar that we talked about specific things. Some of you can lower your cell phone bill. Some of you can get rid of cable. That's more money to put towards debt. Some of you can change where you're living or how you're living. Some of you can get rid of some of the cars and carpool and all of those things to get more money flowing into your home so that you can eventually get debt free. But it's going to take time. It's going to take time, but that's okay. Because once you get to that point, that's wealth. Actually, you're getting wealthier as you're getting out of debt. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You, you, when you do your accounts, and hopefully everybody balance your checkbook or have something like Quicken to keep your accounts, and some of you don't want to look at it, you need to look at it. You need to see how much you work. I love that you just look at that little thing. Once you put all your debts, you're like, how much am I worth? When you add up all your debts, all right, that's how much you owe, and then you add up all your assets, that's how much you really have. And then you put them together, and if it's in the negative, that's how much you're worth, or you're in the positive, that's how much you work. Then you can look at it, and it's really sober when you look at that number and you work negative twenty thousand dollars. Negative fifty thousand dollars. And you may everything may look good, but you can see and you have to ask yourself, God, is this where you would have me to be? Is this where I'm gonna make an impact for your king? Look at this uh, scripture as we go to Proverbs 13, 21 and 22. Someone read that first part, please. 
This is a, a troubling scripture for me because it, it says something that's very powerful. It talks about trouble chasing sins. And I'm not even know how you raise your hand because some of you, you ever felt like trouble is right behind you? Like that bill, if, if you don't get another dollar, that bill is going to overcome you. And you live like that from month to month. And it's like the money is just chasing you down. And you feel the pressure over and over again. But it says good people leave an inheritance to their who? Let's think about that. Any, any thoughts on that? What's that? What's that? Grandchildren. I used to hear it to your children. And I was not in my grandmother. I didn't do nothing. They grown. <laughs> I taught them how what they need to do. So what I have is I'm um, that's left. Yeah, they can have it, but in my mind, saying I'm leaving something, I'm trying to store something for them. I don't understand why that should be. If you don't raise your children to be, be responsible adults to take care of their families and, and that kind of thing. Okay. I mean, my family, my mom and dad. My mom. It wasn't about leaving. They didn't have anything, but it wasn't about leaving us anything. I don't think. But yes, all. They didn't have, we weren't in debt because of what they did, you know. When they died, everything was paid for, you know, they, that kind of stuff. Yes, we inherited stuff, but it wasn't like, we're saving this for you. It was, you know. Because right. so right. I don't want anybody else's problem myself, you know. Because, like, I inherited my brother's property and stuff, and I was really trying to get it to somebody else, which I think, trying to get it. Because I, I have enough on me now. I don't want to get that, you know. Right, right, right. Same thing with our children. I don't think our children should be able to do the same thing. Okay. Uh, I don't know what they pay because they work with parents. No, that's wrong. That's their life. They have to start their own life. Okay. Yeah. Mark? I kind of see it as a way of kind of like, you know, handing forward yeah. as far as, you know, kind of for me. My grandparents have left me tons of land. But about us, they got to it. And they were like, wow, you know, money, money, money. Like the love of money, sin crept in and they lost it. And what happened is what that scripture says, they, they all went to the God and they went and all that land, <coughs> all that land and gone and went to the church and they made it out of a cemetery. So now all the hard earned money that my grandparents worked so hard for and a lot of the land that was supposed to have been for us. Now there's a graveyard, which somebody's mm -hmm. there. And I'm like, wow. But I see that as, you know, them working hard saying, you know, when we leave here or when we leave, we want to give you guys something, you know, so you can take care of it. And you pass it on. And it keeps on going and blessing, you know, for many generations. So we learn, okay, you know, throw your money, you know, be wise, and this goes, you don't have to learn. All right. Yeah. When I, when I see that, and, um, I'm sure there are other families that all of this, but all I can think of are descendants. They have a legacy. Mm -hmm. And part of it is the money and the property that they own. Part of it is the political um, legacy that they leave behind. But a Kennedy, just because they're born into that family, there's a whole mindset that goes with being a Kennedy. But part of that is because of the money. And, and because they have that mindset, they're going to keep that money. Not only going to keep that money, they're going to keep that legacy. They're going to keep that reputation. It all goes together. If you don't leave anything to your kids, it's not just leaving money to your kids, but it's leaving your name. It's leaving your um, values. It's leaving your money. And because kids will say, well, yeah, my mom and dad, they said they're all these great people, but they didn't leave me anything. But if you leave them something tangible, then the whole legacy kind of goes along with that. It's something that they feel they have to keep up. What you're selling, I want to get all those, those hands, and I kind of want to sum up those. <coughs> your mindset of your finances now are going to somehow affect your grandkids. Mm -hmm. Okay? It, this is not talking about just treasures that you pass down, but it's mindset. Mm -hmm. All of us sitting here got a mindset from our mom and dad or our grandparents. 
And if you got a wrong mindset, maybe it's always been wrong in there and something changed in midstream. But as Christians now, as we're realizing, I want to control my finances, we've got to come to the point, how do I want my grandkids to live? And how do I want to control my funds now? Literally, that I could pass something down even to them. That means, and this is the key, in order to live financially, uh, being a financial steward of the Lord the proper way, you can't live for yourself. You can't say it's all about me and what I want. You actually got to use your finances in a way that you're thinking about how can I reach out to, to a generation, my grandkids? How can I make this go out further? It changes everything. It changes what you purchase. It changes how you live. It changes uh, just, just your simple things because you always have the mindset, it's not about me. I'm thinking about my baby. But a lot of us have been raised. If you get it, I'm not saying that you can't, you know, do things for yourself, but you know what? A lot of things we have, we just really don't need. It. We really, really don't need. It. Brother Tim. about paying the four. Um, I mean, because I don't know if this is the same scripture about laying up the inheritance, inheritance for your children's children. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, the, the, in other words, God, you know, he would have you, it's just like, I mean, I, I'm repeating it, but it's basically the same thing as uh, uh, your family heritage. Just keeping it going forward. You're keeping your name going on, you know, and everything that goes with your name, and everything that you work for. You know, you just paying it for, you know, and um, you work hard. You teach your children to work as hard 
to keep what you what you pass to them, that they'll do the same thing paying it forward. You know, so that way you'll lay up your inheritance for your children's children, and they do the same thing for their children's children, and they do the same thing for their children's children. So it's paying it forward. And that's how God had it set up. To me, that's how he has it set up. That way, you know, I mean, granted, he did say the poor would always be with us, but they can pass on, if they don't have the finances to pass on, they can pass on their love, you know, and pay it for, you know, but somebody in, within that uh, heritage is going to turn it around.
Target, the uh, Walmart, the Sam's, they own all that land out there. Mm -hmm. They passed off only about three of the, of the relatives, land relatives, as possible from the rest of them fought over each other. And the mindset, the mindset wasn't changed. Look at that quote. If you would be wealthy, think of what? Save it. Save it. Circle it. <laughs> Can you want to be wealthy? I know y'all want to be wealthy. But you got to change your mindset. If you would be wealthy, think of saving as well as giving. you got to put something aside. So God blesses you with more. you got to figure out, how can I save more? How can I get out of debt? And that's going to be your savings plan for some of you to get out of debt. That's going to be your savings plan to pay that debt off because your debt with your interest, and we went through this in the other seminar, um, you're, some of you are paying 15%, 20%, 8% on stuff, and you're not even making that with your investments. So every month, the hard money that you're working for, and those that you finance with, they're prospering, going on, and you're struggling. And you're teaching that to your kids a lot of times, and they're going to be in the same generation. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, people who have children out of wedlock, if you were here, what usually happens with their children? It's a cycle. It's a, it's a study. You can believe it or not. You can go study it. It doesn't happen with everybody, but a lot of times that cycle continues over and over again. Tally. I was just thinking, I always tell my parents, um, some of the things that we've done, in life and I see people who are always busting the second and things and with all these stuff and they're struggling to buy the Jordans, they're struggling to buy all this stuff. And then I go into our restroom and I see our nice toilet paper. And I go, thank you to my parents for maybe not getting me all the stuff that I wanted, but you know what? We have some nice toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> we have things that really bad. I mean, every year we usually go on a trip as a family and that's so important. There's so many people here who have never even been out of North Carolina. They have all this stuff, but they're struggling. They don't even have family time. They're always working, trying to get all this stuff, but they're not leaving that legacy because they have all this money, but they're not teaching their children how to budget and how to do things with it. So when they leave it, yes, you have the people who are fighting. Yes, you have this because all they've been taught is work, 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 so that you can have something left over. But really, I feel like this scripture means that you're giving your legacy, your inheritance is the saving, but it's also the love of Christ. It's also giving to others by leaving something to your family. You're teaching selflessness, not to leave it all to yourself. You're showing them, you know what, God loves us so much. He left an inheritance to us. He came down to earth to die for us, to leave us heaven. In the Bible it says that we have this glory that inheritance in heaven. And I think what that scripture is saying is that we should mirror Christ in all we do with even leaving an inheritance to our children to show what Christ has already done for us. What are we going to pass down? Look at that, that quote. Time is more valuable than what? Money. money. You can get more money, but you cannot what? Get more money. Money. You know, some of you, 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 you are, you're going to have to work more to get out of your, the point where you're at because you've dug such a deep a hole. But it's not to keep working like that. What you want to do is buy yourself time. <coughs> I mean, time is important. And my time is important. I've chose to live at a certain level so I can have more time for nothing me. So I can have more time for my family. So I can do certain things and I'm not always trying to you know, because I'm spending so much, so I have to work so much, and you have to do all of this, and time, how much is time to you? How much is literally time to you? So this whole process and mindset, we've got to change, and we've got to ask ourselves, are we in the place of leaving something to our brain keep? Are we even close? You know, I'm not talking about just your life insurance policy. That's a part of being physically responsible and everything. But I'm just talking about in what you pass down. Is this going to be effective to help your grandkids and your mindset that you're living now? Or are they going to grow up to be just like you, in debt, in this full cycle over and over? Hey. Um, Of that family to 
watch them fight over the house. That's our son over there on the left. It sort of baffled me because my grandmother had changed the wheel and the youngest child ended up getting the house because he was there. He, you know, he basically set in order what was going on. Like they have properties in South Carolina. All of them have a cut of it. My uncle was the one that was paying the bill. He didn't ask them for anything. He paid the um, tax on that land every, like, every year. And that's what was a cycle. And then it was like my aunt came in and it was just like a, you know, like a turmoil thing. And for me, and I told my mom this, I had to tell my dad, but I told my mom this, I said, for me, to be a grandchild watching this, what are you doing? Like, right, like, Strong. okay, so you were, you telling me that when all y'all die off and it's the house been passed down, passed down, passed down, and it comes down to a grandchild to get it, you mean to tell me we got to, we're going to be fighting too? Good like, one. I don't understand that. Correct. Right. Yeah, actually, when I was young, I was just getting out of here. I was just that I was just that I got stuck in the state and stuff. And I was going to be able to go. And I was putting about, I don't remember how much time I was putting. It's bad stuff. All I was getting was $50 for all I was seeing that I was going to get out and even with that, before well, I realized I didn't feel so much, I turned around once at a time, and I could say I had a nice bottle in my pocket. It was $50 a month out of my check. And I, and I put my mother in her name on my uh, savings account, and she went back to that time. Back down the street from where she was in Brooklyn. And I was like, well, then my mother called me and said, I'm going to take care of you. Well, I'm going to take care of you. 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 I'm going to take care of you my savings to uh, you know, get the house, do everything you got to do down there, <coughs> take everything down and I said, fine. I'm really thinking that, you know, they just do it. They won't be back like that. When I turn around, back to the road, they say, you don't want to have anything to do with the savings to stop. I said, well, you know, I just look at it like that. That's my mother. I could, I could stay in but it kind of came to me a little bit because then I'm going to be able to find a thing that's going to be my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I go home that much. <laughs> so uh, it, it hurt me because, you know, if you'd have planned that a little bit more, you're like, oh, man, that's my mother. That's my mother. I got to help my mother. She just told me something, you know, something. She was going to take it down. I mean, I was putting my brother to school. I was doing anything with my face. But uh, the day he's gone, I just, well, so I said I would never do anything like that again. If I ever have anybody on my bank account, it's going to be my wife. So that day, God knows, I don't think nobody else has the license on it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody read that script and I get the rest. Proverbs 15 said. There is treasure in the house of the godly, but the wealth of the earth is corrupted. Okay. There's many causes of trouble. Start to lose straight out of there. It's going to change your challenge your mindset. There's treasure in the house of the God. Treasure. But you got to add your debts and your assets. How much do you really have? If, if you're, and I, I, I taught this on Sunday. If somebody came and said, you know what, we got to pay all your debts right now, what would you be left with? And they had to take everything out of your house to try to pay for it. What would you have? Put in your clothes. <laughs> what, what would you have? And, that's, and I don't want to scare you. I, don't, I do want to make you feel bad. Because I want you to see, because it's going to change. It's got to, you've got to change the way you see things. you got to get upset about this thing. you got to get angry and say, you know what? The devil has hoodwinked me in so many ways. And God is saying, I want to bless you. I want to bless you. I want to get you to a point of not being there. And look at this. He wants you to have treasure in your house with the earnings of the wicked bring trouble. What does Solomon mean by treasure in the house? He means when it comes to the point, you really have lasting substance. You're passing down wisdom. You're passing down that something that is real. Something that means something. Something that is solid. That's what the scriptures are talking about. And it changes with us really saying, God, this is about you. I'm supposed to be a good steward for the Lord. Now, if you're not a Christian, it doesn't matter. You just live and do your own thing. 
But if you are a Christian, it matters. God says we're going to have to give an account for every word that we say. You think he's going to be looking at our finances too? He is, because he's given us all wisdom. He's given us the spirit, but we've got to follow out his scriptures. So I dread it. Next, I just want to read uh, Proverbs 28. Better to be poor and honest than to be dishonest and rich. Just mm-hmm. right. one challenge. We got poor, but see, we're not taught that. And I don't want you to be poor, but it's better to be rich and dishonest. No. No. It's not what it says, but that's what the world says. Yeah. It's better to be rich and cheat on your taxes, cut corners. That's what the world says. But God says, no, actually it's better to be poor and honest than to be dishonest and rich. We walk in this by putting God first. We walk in this by, by taking account for what we've done, where we've messed up, the pressure. If you're at the point, you know, someone gives you the wrong change, and you're still broke, and you're like, okay, um, they gave me more change than I really want. This is a blessing of the Lord you put in your pocket. <laughs> bad. Or if you're at the point, you know, you see your taxes, and some of you are at that point. Praise the Lord, I got my taxes done about a week ago. I'm excited. You know, things have passed out this year. It's done real good. But if you're at the point, you're like, man, if I just change this, nobody will know. You just kind of do that. Maybe you're at this point and thinking, oh, man, to have more is better, but it's not. Now, I heard this story the other day that, um, Someone went to go get their air conditioning done or something, but they went to the bank to get like a thousand dollars. They had all this money, and actually it was like a thousand dollars, but they came like two thousand in cash. So the bank actually gave them two a thousand dollars too much. And so they were like, "What are we gonna do?" And they went back to the bank and they gave the money. And then a couple of like twenty years later, um, her husband became a bank teller. And he gives this person his money. And he actually gave this person too much money. And the person came back and gave it to him because he could have really lost his job had that happened. And she said, you know, they have a thing of coming back on you. Since we gave that money back 20 years ago, when we needed it, because he gave too much money, it came back to us and he was able to keep his job. Um, I'm just going to kind of sum it up as we begin. To look, look at this quote. I'm saying, what difference does it make how much you have? What do you what you do not have amounts to much more. Does that make sense? What difference does it make how much you have? What you do not have amounts to much more. You gotta change our mindset. I know I put one of my taxes on my And that's fine, that's actually how you're supposed to do it for you. But the issue is, even getting past that, some people live for the tax return. That's going to get you here, right? Yes, but that's not the mindset we should have. It's controlling what we have all year long. So that's not, actually, if you know you don't have to pay taxes, why do you let it slip up on you? For the last few years, I pay taxes every year, big money. And I just knew that, so what does my family have to do? We know we got to put that aside so I don't have to go in debt for my taxes. Isn't that sad? We have to go in debt to pay your taxes? So many people do that. That's not the way to do it. So we're changing our whole mindset, controlling what we have at, at the lowest point. Asia, um, of Psalm 49, the truth about wealth. Can somebody get that chapter? I want to read through this real quick. Yeah, read Psalm 49. So turn over your Bible and put it Psalm 49. Uh, Whoever gets there first, you can read. I want to get through this chapter. Yeah, read Hear this, all people. Give here, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall give understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will disclose my dark saying on the heart. Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. 
for the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever, that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. For he sees wise men die, likewise the fool and the senseless person perish, and leave their wealth to others. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever, their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beast that perish. This is the way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve their saying. Like the sheep they are, laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall be consumed in the grave, far from their dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Do not be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lives, he blesses himself. For men will praise you when you do well for yourself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. A man who is in honor, yet does not understand, is like the beast that perish. <laughs> not that way, huh? It is about finances. It's about our lives. And face it, when you die, can you take it with you? It's so much time dealing with this whole process, and 49 really hits it. Somebody give me a, a something that, that spoke to you when we read that. Anybody, what did Psalms 49 speak to you? Can't take the Can't take the But we sure spent a lot of time trying to hold on to it. Fighting, scraping for it, but we can't take it. You know, they actually fall dead a long time ago. If you back away, they can, you can't take all your money with it. You can't take 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 it. You and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, what? You believe it? But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to, fool, to many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money. That's what we fight against. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith. Right? It's talking to Christians. Some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. And look at this. And pierced themselves through with what? Many sorrows. Psalm 112. Someone turn to that real quick. Psalm 112. Whoever gets to it, just read it real quick.
it up. No matter how you look at it. Any amen in the house? Amen. amen. That's not God's best for us. It's just not. Yeah, if you're in debt, there's ways that you can say better debt, but that's not God's best for us. Because this is the key. Actually, on the translation says, and the bar is a slave. Why is it a slave? They own it. Got you. And it's not them. We put ourselves in that position. And we all know that, but we go into it anyhow, and we kind of justify, we try to justify, but we, you ever felt the shackles? You feel them? You feel them? In the month, the first of month, you, you can hear the change. You know, you can feel it, you can feel it, but we just kind of go on, and we go, we, we ask the slave master, and I'm not trying to be rude, we say, you know, as long as I can still get my hair done, I can look at cable. And, um, you know, I can have my cell phone and everything. I'm happy with the change. Our mindset has to change. That we're not going to be happy with that, but we want to set a new standard. Actually, not a new standard. It's an old standard. It's what God says. Matthew 22, 17, 21. So I want to read that real quick. Who does money belong to? <laughs> Who does this money belong to? <laughs> Our government, really. Yeah. Get, don't get caught up. We use it. Jesus paid taxes. But this is our government that we created and we put faith in what this means. Don't get caught up in it. Because that's the piece of fact. Okay? Yes, it buys us some things. And for some of us, it helps us to live, live better, per se. But when it all comes down to it, we're responsible to the Lord. The God, the, our Father, uh, He supplied all our needs. All our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, in spite of this. And Gina hit it on, hit on that. In spite of this, God can still prosper you. Yeah. I've learned that money is not just money that you can see. But the, what helps me is realizing money that I can't see is even more powerful. Exactly. Money that I can save is more powerful than just money coming in. If I can keep the money that I have, that's powerful. And that's what our mindset has to change within that. Look at these, some quotes here. It says, the mint makes it first. It is up to you. Make it last. <laughs> Evan SR said that the mint makes it first. It's up to you to make it last. I want to challenge you as we, we're, we're summing all these things up. How can I make this last? Look at that other The trick is to stop thinking of it as your money. Who said that? I <laughs> It's my money. I can do whatever I want to do with it. The trick is to stop thinking it is your money. I'm a steward of this. All right? God has allowed this. I want to make sure that I'm using it properly. All right? Um, Proverbs 28, 22. Greedy people do what? Get rich quick. I know none of you agree. <laughs> if we were eyes. All of us have some of that greed. But we just want it. I told you today, Benjamin and I, we're struggling. You know, we could. We could go get, we, we've got the money to do that. But I'm trying to learn more patience and to be calm and, you know, to, to use my money that it will please the Lord. But we struggle with that because we want it quick. I want it now. I don't want to wait. I want it now. But look at this. Greedy people try to get rich quick but don't realize they're headed for what? Uh, why? Why would getting rich quit lead you to poverty? Yes, ma'am. Um, this just reminded me of a problem I had at my job. At the, begin, at the beginning of the school year, I targeted a lot of African-American kids because as Dickie Kelly said, a lot, 80% of jail, well, in our school system, most of our black males have the lowest scores at the end of the year or the lowest grades. So my thing was, I'm going to talk to him, have them stay for tutoring, and we get these breaks up. But the biggest excuse I hear from kids is they can't come because they don't have gas money. 
But like Tabitha said, they have on the latest Jordans. I have girls that get their nails and their hair done every week. They have cell phones in middle school with a plan that I couldn't even afford. But yet, they don't have gas money to get five minutes away from school because they all live in the same low-income housing. And it's just really sad that the kids who do stay are staying not because they need tutoring, but they're telling me, I'm going to get afford every year. These are kids that don't even really need the tutoring. I'm letting them go ahead of what their curriculum is stating so they can get that for or maybe even skip a grade. And it's mainly Caucasian and Hispanic kids. I cannot get my African-American kids to show up. And then when I interview them to see what they want to be when they get older, they all want to be NBA players, but they don't play basketball. They want to play <laughs> and I just want to say, I know it's not correct to say as a teacher, baby, that ain't going to happen. But sometimes I want to say, it's going to end for you in high school. You're a good athlete, but you're not going to go anywhere because you haven't concentrated on what's important, and that's the educational part. So I see that a lot. It's like if you win the lottery. That was a quick rich. But like you said, you know, uh, um, it's been said that in 10 years you're going to be broke because what you do is you start thinking about the things that you wanted to have when you didn't have the money. You go out and buy this, you go out and buy that, you help this person, you help that person. And instead of uh, doing the right thing, you know, probably invested it or whatever, turn it over, make the money work for you. You working for the money and you lose it and you get and when you lose it, you worse off than what you were because now you have all these other assets that is costly and you don't have the money to pay for it now. So you putting yourself you backed yourself up and going back and you're going back and Good point. How do you teach your kids about our money and being a good steward? What we're doing now, our seminars, looking at money, looking at the scriptures, and telling your kids where you are. We're very open with our kids. Um, uh, we can tell them, hey, this costs, we get some plumbing, we told them how much that costs, we let them know financially, we help them out, tap is going through, so you can get to out the FAFSA and all of that other stuff. We're very upfront about them. When we were getting out of debt, we did, we had celebrations. You know, parts of celebration, you know, Lord, we paid this off. You know, this this is like, let's go eat. You know, let's go eat. <laughs> we did, didn't we? We, we? we did. We would pay off a ton and then we would kind of celebrate. Then we would hit it back again. And they, they walked with us through this whole process. And we were very open, which was contrary. When I grew up, mom and dad just didn't talk about money. They just, I, I thought they were rich. I did. I did. I did. I thought my dad was rich because I didn't understand the debt side. I just thought if you had a whole bunch of stuff, if you were able to buy a car every three 
years, you had to be ready. But later on, I found out that wasn't true when I realized the small cars that they had to go to, they were paying like it was a $50,000 car. I'm like, what? God, nobody ever told me that. I just thought, you know, you just, just keep this thing up. And nobody told me there was debt on that. Nobody told us that. But it looked real good. All my growing up, we were able to, to, to get stuff. My sister, I didn't get it, but she would get Nike. And, <laughs> and stuff like that. I thought everything was, was cool. But I realized there was another side. So back to your question, we got to talk through it. we got to be real honest. Tell them what we messed up. I told my kids where I messed up, the decisions I made that were wrong, and I don't want you to make those decisions. I tell them about my college career. I got a full scholarship to A&T, but I chose to go to the military because that's where I felt that God wanted me. And when I came out of the military, I still had money from the GI Bill, and I was able to pay for my own college and go from there. And to go to college, you know what? You know I'm an English major? You know? It's a question. Because <laughs> it was the quickest way I could get out of college. It was where my wife was at. So I came back after the military, and I said, you know what? How can I get out of this? Get my degree as quick as I can. I get a whole bunch of other degrees, but how can I view my wife and get out? And I chose English. Because everything else that I did in my life kind of got me through that. It wasn't a major thing like, you know what, I want to be Oprah or, you know, this or lawyer, doctor. It was just a simple thing. I'm tired of school. I went to school in the military. I want to use my GI Bill and get out. But God used that. God used that. So a lot of times we do all these planning. I'm going to be this and that. And you don't know nothing. You don't know nothing. Amen. It it. I'm going to be this when I grow up. <laughs> you don't know. You need to talk to the Lord. That's what you need to do. Marcus, we got like one more slide. We'll be finished. And I think, too, that you look at so many people, like, you know, you look at what they have, and we're like, wow, you know what? That's hot. You know, like they have a nice ride, or, you know, they have a you know, five home or whatever, you know, and I have so many uncles who are so caught up, you know, and, 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 and they, you know, oh yeah, well, you know, I went over to chosen eight banks and bought three shirts, and I'm like, dude, that's 80 bucks per shirt, we told you, you know, and,
to have joy in your heart without all of the happiness that you get for a temporary thing. Because it's only temporary, it's only way it's been, and then, then you go back to the stars. So you don't have joy in your heart that the Lord is going to have in your heart. If you want to know what God thinks about money, just what? Not always when you look at the lives of people who are rich and famous, you can see money is not all of that. Because it takes on a total different dimension to it. It really does. And that final one, Psalm 119, 36 and 40, and I give you 10, it says, Give me an eagerness for your law rather than a love for money. An eagerness for your word rather than a love for money. And it changes everything. It says, turn my eyes from worthless things and give me light through your word. Reassure me of your promise made to those who fear you. Help me abandon my shameful way for your regulations are good. I long to obey your commandments. Renew my life with your goodness. Money will come when you're doing the right thing. My whole mindset, I didn't want to, with this scriptural point, I didn't want to have to give you, okay, do this, do this, do this. I want to change how you think. All right? I want to change how you think. And when you start, when you start your, to change the way you think, God opens up more, and you start making the right decisions. Money's going to come. Money's not a problem, really. Money is not your problem. Your mind and the scriptures, that's your problem. Money is not, there's, there's plenty of money out there. There's plenty of money out there. Now, a lot of that's dwindling and stuff. But for the Christian, God will provide. But he wants us to change the way we think. Tim. Yeah. And I think also we got to, by having this class and dating by the and talking to each other, and we, and we do share with each other, sharing through the scriptures. I think about your friend about um, you buy certain things out of it. You sit there and talk to him and say, you know what? I've had houses for a long time. He said, I've found things like that. But I've made the same thing. I've been honest with you. And that's put on the table and let them all of a sudden say, you know, there's going to be a mistake in the name. And you start teaching the financial stewardship class to pay to do a search. And he said, well, what people have to realize, you have to put all that stuff aside and be honest and be and transparent. And, you know, we will and learn from each other. Um, I think about, you know, conversations, you know, a long time ago with Sister Kelly, and she's like, I'm going to keep that car until it falls apart. But, you know, nowadays, and even in my generation, people don't think like that. Mm-hmm. You know what? Yeah. If this working and this running, why go out and spend $30,000 on a brand new car? That whole mindset, and as we sum it up, I've been trying to try to be open with y'all, and I've talked to a lot of families who are, who are going through, um, and, and not to, to make you feel bad, I just want to let you know what God has blessed the wood now. So we're no difference. We, you can look up my, my salary from um, I, I got five kids, a beautiful wife, a grandma, and a mom. Uh, and, and we stayed, mom moved in about four years ago. Grandma's been with us seven years, yeah. a, about seven years, and God has provided. They told us, uh, beyond how we were crazy for having one child when we were in college, and we just lost our mind for two childs, and then after the third child, we just figured we could just move. <laughs> and, and, and then we had the fourth and fifth, and Bianca, have we ever had to ask them for money, those who talk? No, not that we were so great and grand, God just provides for you when you put Him first. And I'm telling you this because I want you to be blessed. And when you change your mindset, you may say, well, you know what? I'm doing all right. Do you want to just do all right? Do you want to be in God's will that you can reach out and not struggle? Final thought. I just want to this bless me. Um, a few years, a few few weeks ago, um, we, we, we had a clock in our pool. clock. Or <laughs> rocks. Everything. We... <laughs> and and it's the plumber has to visit our house like once a year. And I know how much it is. He charges, you know, 
$56 just to come out. Just to come out and tell you it's clogged. <laughs> <laughs> this $56 just to tell you it's clogged and then they're going to do the diagnosis and everything. So finally, after Farmer had done this, and we knew this was coming, but, but he said, you know what? To fix this right, it's going to cost you $3,000. And I kind of knew we got an older house, 1902. You know, we've just been kind of playing with this thing. <laughs> but because we've been saying, put this out. Because he was concerned, he'd already put, pulled out the finance. <laughs> you know, for all you know, he he already done that. Because we got all this Christian stuff on our walls, and we were preparing for something like this. I didn't want it to go, but I knew it was going to come. And you know what? Just knowing when he saw us being able to write the check, being able to do that. Because he saw the kids running through the house. I know he thought. <laughs> welfare stamp. If you want welfare, I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying, God has blessed the wood household. And you know what? To still pay that and still have money in your savings. That's where God wants to go. To still give and not be stressed out. Some of you, you you, you drive your car by faith because you just can't do maintenance on it. You just know, if this breaks down... I'm finished. I'm through. So you you hear that click, 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 and you know you need to go to the like, Lord, please. It's Jesus' day. Why stay there? Why stay there? Let's change this whole thing. And when you hear the first click, you know what? I've been putting aside. I've been living below my means. You can go, and when they say, you know they're going to use say it. Five hundred and six hundred dollars you can say, go ahead and move on with your life. God wants better for all of us. It starts today. It starts with your mentality. And I'm telling you, if God did it for me and God, we we don't make a lot of y'all make more money than we do. If God did it for us, He'll do it for you. You just got to change the way you think and say, God, it's all about you. Come to your feet. Let's close down. Mother Bay, do you have something? Okay. Wisdom from the Lord. Can I have the money? God is good. Let's grab hands because I, I want us to connect on this so that you can kind of look around the room and you can see. Other